Just before we get to the legend, Chris Walby. Now, this is uh, courtesy of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. They put together uh, this uh, tremendous montage and, and look back at a, a tremendous career. And he goes, it goes all the way back to when he was, like, little. And as you know, for Chris Walby, there's not a lot of little in his lifetime. Uh, deserve it of being in the Hall of Fame. We're excited, and we talk to him next. But first, here's Chris Walby. Chris had it all. He was tough. He was quick. He was certainly large. He was massively strong. And whether he was coming out blowing you up on the run or whether he was pass pro, he just couldn't win. Christopher is the oldest. I was born in 1956. He was adorable. That was when he was a baby. Uh, he was an active toddler. He was absolutely normal. He was good in school. He was good at everything. And he was normal until he was 17 years old, he was my height, which is five foot eight. And between 17 and 21, I think he grew seven inches. It was a, a standard family back then. I mean, obviously, you know, born in 56 and, and growing up as a youngster, uh, mom, mom stayed at home. Dad worked at Hydro, you know, his whole life. Uh, two sisters, and you know, when you're the only guy in a family, you can understand that that could be a tough thing on a guy. The girls gave him a hard time. Uh, I think it's the other way around, totally. Uh, he'd pick on me all the time, baby sister and all. He was very, very good in everything he did, skating, hockey. But it wasn't until he hit football that he became really hardworking. And we knew he was going somewhere, even way back then. Well, I, I, I always played defense. I was a defensive tackle. I'm a junior. I went to the States. I was a defensive tackle uh, in, in Dickinson State. I, I had pretty good years down there. I was all-conference, made all-American. And when I came to Winnipeg, they looked at me and said, you know what? We think you have a better career. Hello. Hello. Is this Chris hey, Walby? Now. Yeah, how are you doing, big guy? It is. It's Mike Richards from uh, rawmikerichards.com. We're thrilled to have you here uh, on the air with us uh, this morning, Chris. And, you know, we just watched a portion of, of uh, the the Canadian Football Hall of Fame, uh, what they put together with your with your mom talking about uh, your family and w when w when you were as she put it when you were normal she kept using the <laughs> word normal but I got to tell you the the career you had certainly wasn't normal it was above that and I said we're excited to have you on the program today in a in a time where I got to admit if you're a Bomber fan this is a pretty good time is it not. Oh, they're playing well, all, all cylinders. You know what? It's, uh, you don't get excited, but I, I, I was so jacked when they were going to play Edmonton. I was so jacked last week against Montreal because Montreal, for some reason, plays you know decent ball against us. And, you know, two times they've had a chance to win this football game. But Bombers just find ways to win. They, they, they continue to just pull out turnovers at opportune times in the offense. And Matt Nichols, he is playing outstanding. He got, uh, you know, and he got, what's his name? Andrew Harris. Let's not say what's his name, but yeah. the guy is like, in my mind, leading candidate for MOP, the way this guy's playing. Uh, but guys, my juices are flowing for the game coming up this week against the Bombers in Saskatchewan. That's the one I'm jacked about right now. Well, I'm sure. I know you've got a lot of memories where it, it really got a little nasty on the sidelines at times, but that's the way it's supposed to be. I mean, and, and as you know, as a, as a Canadian Football League fan, you know, the best part happens after Labor Day. So we're coming up, the Banjo Bowl. You've got all yep. the rivalries, including what happens. And I don't know, with Hamilton and, and Toronto, it's it's real tough out uh, oh. in the East. That's a little bit of a shame. But uh, that doesn't take away from some of the football being played in the West. And i got to be honest, right now, if I'm looking at the Bombers, are we putting them maybe number two? Well, they are number two right now. And, and, I, and you know what? The only game I think they really got their butts kicked to them was uh, basically against Cal. Calgary is a machine right now. They're playing well. Bo Levi, you know, and that defense, they just got him on all cylinders. I'm a big Dave Dickinson fan. I think he's got that team firing on all cylinders. But I really like the way the other teams are coming up, Winnipeg especially. And I, listen, even though our neighbors to the west of us here, um, you know, they've outscored, what, 95 to something, 39 points the last two weeks. Uh, Chris Jones, after they wanted to get rid of him, 
he's got that team uh, playing pretty decent football, which makes it an exciting, uh, you know, uh, Banjo Bowl or Labor Day, whatever. No, it's Banjo Bowl. That's right. That's Banjo Bowl first, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Chris, uh, David Bast here. Great talking to you. I, 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 have, to, hey. I, have, I have to ask you about uh, Saskatchewan itself. You brought up the point about Montreal, how, how the club doesn't you know usually play well against the Alouettes. Well, well you yeah. know, Labor Day in Saskatchewan and Regina, that hasn't been very good to the Bombers as well. Are, are, you oh. a, are you a tad nervous considering that it looks like the Rough Riders have actually got their act together coming into this week? You know what? I'm excited for it. I love, you know what? I love good football. Yep. I really love competitive football. I don't like when you're going in, like, I'm really sad, guys, not to change the vein of thought here, yep. but I really am sad about the situation going on in Hamilton. It's not good for the league. I mean, they're just, my God, the things that are going on over there. And uh, But, yeah, when we're playing Saskatchewan, it's exciting, especially since, you know, Saskatchewan two, uh, two-game winning streak and beating uh, profoundly yes. BC and Edmonton. Uh, guys, like I'm not blown away by Edmonton. I think Edmonton's a lot of smoke and mirrors right now. I don't think they're that good right now because they've got so many dang injuries. But uh, yeah, I, I just think right now the teams that are on the rise. You know, it's uh, it's got to be Sketch has got to be considered one of them. I mean, four and four right now. Um, it's gonna be tough, but it's gonna be fun. And this is what you play for. This is what you you know to to cover the games. Uh, it's it's just, to me is is totally exciting. I mean, it's nine thirty here in Winnipeg, and uh, I'm jacked up, but I didn't have any coffee yet. <laughs> We're in conversation with Chris Walby here on rawmikerichards.com, and you mentioned some of those names. Now, there have been some changes, and you know uh, Ken Austin very well, what a competitor he is, and you know the kind of resume he's built for himself, which is a, which is a damn good one here in the Canadian Football League and what he did south of the border. But, you know, putting in June Jones, were you surprised at the move? Absolutely. I mean – it just it, it there's something going on internally there. I don't know. A lot of times they, they use that term in hockey where you lose the team, and I think he, I I don't know if he's lost the team because <clears throat> when you bring a guy in as a and all of a sudden he becomes an assistant head coach uh, and you know offense coordinator, and they still had that other uh, young gentleman calling plays. I thought that's really weird right now. Now June Jones runs. You know he likes to run and shoot. Are they going to run the football more? They, they don't have a bad running game, but they just seem to just want to live off the pass. When they're a one-dimensional team like that, I think they're not going to get, you know, and everybody's on Zach Kolaris. You know what? But, guys, I want – listen, they're dropping balls all over the field. They, I, I don't know. They're just not very good. And I'm wondering about the future of Ken Austin. Uh, I wonder if he's going to stay after. I know he's VP of operations. Is he going to stay after this? What about Eric Tillman? He's supposed to be the scout, bringing all these great players in. Uh, boy, I tell you, they, they, they need something over there to spark that team because it's a shame 0-8. Uh, we'll see what happens now after they come off to buy, but uh, that whole Eastern Division, I mean, ten wins total, yeah. and you're looking at the yeah. West thirty. I mean, God bless Ottawa for winning one game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you know, at least you got something going on over there. But you know what? Uh, it's crazy, man. I mean, I, it's like I watched the Montreal. We did the Montreal game. Montreal is playing really well, and Chapdelaine decides to go with a uh, a fake punt. He's trying to pull a page out of Mike O'Shea's book, but they're in their own end, and they were actually playing well. Yeah. You don't get it. We score points off that turnover. It just, yeah, it, 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 I don't get it. I don't know if the cards are just aligning right for the Bombers right now, but uh, other teams should be making some silly mistakes at the end. Yeah, they certainly are. So, Chris, uh, if uh, you know, you ta- kind of talk about the weakness of the Eastern Division, and there has been some talk through the media and uh, social media as well that maybe it's time for the CFL to look at, uh, you know, what uh, breaking down this league as a league and not breaking down division by division, considering how much stronger the West is. Are you in favor of that? Uh, are you in favor of that, considering the Saskatchewan Rough Riders would be sitting in first place in the Eastern Division right now? You know, it's a tough call. I, I know we've talked about this a number of times, guys. And the issue, as is, I guess I see it, is, you know, I love the concept. The concept sounds great. Top teams make the playoffs, as should be. Yep. But the other, thought, the other thing that bothers me or worries me is you've got these huge markets in Toronto and Hamilton and Montreal and Ottawa. And if, this, if they don't increase or if they just sit and they become bottom dwellers for so long, you lose your fan base. It just becomes a lack of interest because they got no chance. And, like, I, I got to tell you, I was talking to Troy Westwood the other day on air, and I said, you know what, if I'm a guy watching from the States and I'm watching a telecast, 
and I see a Hamilton team in 0-8, and, and, and they're going, well, they still got a chance for the playoffs. You know what I'm thinking? <laughs> what kind of freaking league is this? You know what I mean? So, then when I hear that crap, I say, yeah, we need to change it to one. But then the other thing, the fear, the fear factor of the East not getting better and then just losing their fan base. And I know Toronto's already trying to do whatever they can to get people there. Yeah. You need to have these markets play better. And maybe they got to spend some money. And maybe they got to pull in some talent there because it's been too long when the East is just, they just been cellar dwellers. But then again, you look at Ottawa last year, eight, nine, they win a great cup. So, what do I know? Well, you know? and here's the thing, Chris. I think I think you bring up two points. Number one, from a from an athlete's perspective, from a competitor's perspective, the best should get in. That's how we you you played yeah. your whole life. Yeah. That's why when you played, whether it was hockey or or, or going and playing college yeah. ball, the best win, the best guys make the team. There's no favorites here. But you know, as a Canadian, damn well, they're not showing up in Hamilton. They're yeah. certainly not showing up in Toronto if they think it's useless because Saskatchewan's going to have a better record than us. No one's moving on. And that's the, that's the, that's the crumb where that's you know that's the issue we have right now. But again, that's almost like an excuse because it should be the best teams that play. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, if I'm in the West and I end up like six wins and I can't get, I, I'm not in the playoffs. Or seven, you know, I'm not in the playoffs, and everyone in the East is worse than I am. Well, this there, there is an issue. Then we have to we have to address something's got to address. I do like our commissioner. I uh, I think Ambrosi, uh, you know, he's done a great job of getting rid of that. You know, 18 bloody challenges every game where, you know, guys were challenging, uh, yeah. you know, somebody ate popcorn in the first row, throw the flag, you know, inter- <laughs> inter- you know interfere with it. You know, it's just crazy. So now it's fast. Boom, boom. You got one challenge, you lose it, it's over. You win it, it's over. I loved it. But, uh, no, to your point, guys, I really, well, I'm torn about that, uh, should we have one division, but I, I just think the best team should be rewarded. And uh, if, if, if the E starts to suck and it or continues to suck, then somebody in that organization has got to do whatever it can to get the talent there. Bring back pinball in Toronto. <laughs> there you, you know, go. Whatever. There you go. Exactly. Well, hey, and you bring up another thing we're talking about Ambrosi, and and it is it, maybe he's making good decisions because he's an offensive lineman, and all offense offensive linemen <laughs> have always told me they're better looking, Chris. They're smarter people. They're better athletes. They're better everything. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this: we're, we're probably not better looking. I would say that. I'll, I'll give him that. But, oh my God, we're not even close, man. I tell you right now. Oh, you know what, Matt Dunnigan? I like Matt Dunnigan, but he wrote his SAT test on Saturday. You know what I mean? It's just you no. Know, <laughs> Hey, we're in conversation with three-time Grey Cup champion, nine-time All-Star, two-time Most Outstanding Offense alignment, and, of course, Hall of Famer Chris Walby on the program. You talk about Matt Dunnigan. He was one of the quarterbacks that you played with, a lot of the Hall of Fame quarterbacks you played with. One of my favorites was Dieter Brock. I'm a Winnipegger, hard and heart, and still am. Uh, Also, Tom Clemens. Who was your favorite quarterback uh, to work with when you were on that offensive line and in that huddle, and you knew that with this guy, we're doing something because, Chris, you played with a lot of great ones. Well, you know, you mentioned just three, and I mean, you could throw Johnny Huffnagel in there. You can throw, you know, uh, you know, Sean Salisbury in there. I, we, I was blessed. I mean, but well, you know, I came in the league in 1981 with Dieter Brock. Dieter Brock, the guy, that, you know, they say they can throw, you know, a ball through the car wash while getting the ball wet. He was just, uh, I'm just an amazing quarterback. I mean, obviously playing here and then, you know, uh, going to uh, Hamilton when we got uh, Tom Clements, who I think is probably the most cerebral quarterback I ever played with. Uh, D- different styles. Tommy would come in, you know, he looked like a little accountant. You know, he's not the biggest cat. He'd have his briefcase, and, you know, he just would come in there and just he'd just run the offense. And if you told him to run something, I sometimes can be vocal and huddle, you know, I'll say, run the ball, come on, for God's sakes. And he'd be one of those guys that just turn to me and say, Walby, shut the F up. We're just doing it. We're doing it. And then you got, uh, you know, then you got Mike, uh, excuse me, um, Matt Dunnigan. Now, Dunny. You know, and everybody's made the fact that this guy, he's one of the toughest SOBs I ever played with, and I love him. He's a, he's a winner. He's got pedigree all over him. I gave him the nickname Peacock because <laughs> when, he, when he came in the lock, locker room and he had he got his uh, he got his drawl going, he had a little drawl from Texas, and he started strutting around in the bow-legged legs he's got. I said, we're going to win. Yeah. We're going to win. <laughs> when he's got that draw going and his bow-legged gets even more bow-legged, I don't know if that's a good word, He's great, but I tell you what, when he comes in sometimes, he's quiet. I'm like, oh, boy. Boy, something's long tighter than a bad top right now. we got to get this guy loosed up. But this guy, you know, two times he's with us. We go to the Great Cup in both years. Uh, and, I, and there's no doubt in my mind, 93, he doesn't blow his, 
ACL. We're winning the Great Cup. Exactly. He's that good. He's a leader. He's fun to party with. And you got to party with you guys. I mean, we, we're, we're letting – I should mention one guy, too. And he, he led us to the 1990 Great Cup. He played Saskatchewan. Like, come on, man. He's never going to forget. Tommy Burgess. There you go. Number 13. Tommy Burgess. Yeah. What? He always drive by his beers. You know, he's like, oh, I'll, I'll take care of my old line. I'll take care of my boys. And then he tries to go buy drinks with his room key. You know, <laughs> he's a vodka key fucker. Well, you, you also, Chris, I, gotta, I just want to ask you something, too, because, um, uh, you know, when I look at the game of football, which is, is my favorite sport, I love it. I've had a chance to coach it. It's it's just I think it's a, it's a great game changer for, for, for young men. I think it, you know, yeah. people think it's a cliche, but I think if you're around it enough, you understand that there's certain uh, young kids that, that, that get into the sport. They go in with yeah. certain self-esteem issues. They go in with certain issues that, you know, as a teenager, they have to struggle with stuff and they come out. As men, it's the one sport I can say it's not a cliche. It does happen, but the one thing that seems to be paramount in, in talking to guys like yourself and guys who have played, you know, college football that is south of the border, they explain it as having a stud quarterback. And it's exactly how you describe Matt because there are times where I want the guy who comes in the huddle to have the best hair, to have the bow legs, to get the best girls, to party harder than everyone else, and also treat his offensive line better than anybody else. And that's why when I look at guys like Eli Manning. I'm thinking if you're on the offensive line, as much as he's almost created miracles, he doesn't technically and and have by the book. He's not my stud quarterback. No, no, and I agree with you. Listen, uh, I remember uh, when uh, when we we signed Dunnigan, and uh, God bless Matt coming to our team, and then all the guys had to line up in Cal Murphy's office to take pay cuts so we could pay that signing gun. <laughs> and so, no, right. I'm not, that ain't that's the truth. We oh, all took pay yeah. cuts. With the and then you know we went to, we were, had training camp in in, uh, in Brandon, Manitoba, and there's a little watering hole called the Keystone. And uh, boy, he pulled out a roll of water, and, uh, a roll, roll of uh, money, and he just goes, "Okay, boys, it's on me. It's always going to be on me. Just let me know." Wow. He wanted to get in because when he comes in there and you see these grumpy old bastards like us going, "Hey, what the hell is going on here, man?" You know, we're taking pay cuts, so this guy can come over here to stud. You know, he spends half his money on goddamn hair products. You know. What are we going to do? Uh, plus, he's good looking, right? And he had abs. We used to have an old line party here. Well, he shows up. And all the old linemen are wearing, you know, this big baggy shorts. He comes in a freaking Speedo with hearts on it. You know what? <laughs> then, then, you gotta, then you have to kind of settle your wife down for like 18 weeks after. Like, hey, relax, honey. Relax. Uh, all good. Oh, okay. uh, hey, Chris, you, you bring up the name Cal Murphy. And uh, he was nicknamed in Winnipeg, Kindly Cal but I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you something from from. I know I'm getting to it. Trust me, brother. Uh, tr- when growing up in Winnipeg and seeing him, and then finally getting into the media, working for your buddy Joe Pascucci at CKND. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember the two of you were very, very, uh, very good together as well on TV. So, so Kel Murphy and I and I and I look back at the start of my 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 TV side of my career. Kel Murphy and Glenn Sather of the Edmonton Oilers at the time were the two most intimidating guys to talk to because it almost seemed that as a rookie broadcaster, if you ask these guys the wrong question, they would chew your head off. How how was Kel to work with for so long and 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 you were you were there basically his entire time? Yeah, you know what, Kel was a very interesting cat. I, it was a love hate relationship. Uh, I loved the guy because he he was a winner. He knew what. He'd, he'd just come up, and we'd, we'd lose a running back in practice. Go, ah, don't worry about it. Or, you know, receivers and running backs, dime a dozen. We'll bring another one in. Don't worry about it. But, yeah, when you're doing contract, he'd put his feet on a table. He'd look at you. He'd get a piece of little scribbly paper and write a number down and slide it across the table at you. And then he'd pretend he's taking a phone call. There's nobody even on the phone. <laughs> so he's, talk, he's, talk, he's probably talking to his wife, Joyce, in the other room. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got Wall over here. Yeah, he's not that smart as Chad. He'll find Yeah, he'll find <laughs> So, you know, you, you, I take the paper and I put my own number down. And he starts laughing, puts his feet down, hangs the phone up. And then we, we're doing this Scrabble game, going back and forth with a scratchy piece of paper, you know, trying to be on a contract, man. But, uh, no, I, I, I have to say that he was loyal. But he also, uh, there were times that he did some things. Like, I went and tried in the NFL in 1989. Yeah. And I came back and he cut my pay for being disloyal. Oh, wow. uh, that's that's just how the times have changed, right? He said, "You know what? You you you're a, you're a bomber. You should be here. The fact that you're going down there and trying out 
It's a sign of disloyalty. Therefore, you want to stay in the city. Uh, you go to Ottawa. You want to go to Ottawa? I go to Ottawa. I go to freaking Ottawa. He goes, well, guess what? You're taking this. Yeah, 10 grand. Wow. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but then you're talking about the other guy, and you're right. The two guys, Don Matthews. I think you mentioned Don. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Listen, uh, when I was doing TV with uh, Cuthbert and the Mark Lee and those guys, we'd have to do the, pre, you know, the pregame interview uh, or the day before. When, well, he was in Winnipeg. And this guy, I know how Don worked. Uh, when I first came in, he goes, Walls, you need anything, man? You give me a call, brother. You give me a call. All right. So then I go to talk to him, and he's in Winnipeg for a pre, uh, the, the day before game. And he goes, Walby, right in front of everybody, i got to ask you a question. And I go, what's that? Are you drinking before the game? I go, what? <laughs> so I go back, and I go, well, I'm not going to freak. So I said, well, it sounds like you're drinking when you're making some of your calls. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Now, Don Matthews, I respect Don. Listen, winning is cool. I love the guy. But anyway, he got so angry because I, I guess nobody nobody barks back at the Bulldog. Yeah. Anyway, next thing I know, I go to the next game and we're in, I can't remember what city we're in. He walks up to Mark Lee in front of me and goes, I'll talk to you, but not the guy standing to your left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. He just blindfolded me from the locker room. Yeah. Like it you, was just unbelievable. Man. Like wow. you could be missed. And right, right, not that guy. You mean the guy who's blocking the sun? You mean that guy? That guy. Oh, yeah, that baby Huey looking guy over there. Oh, yeah. Hey, well, hey oh, yeah. talking about something, the eclipse happened the other day. I said it's probably just Miles Growl and, and, and Chris Walby walking in front of the. You know, what I mean, oh. I look at that side of the. I mean, I look at the size. And by the way, it lists him. I said I had to look that up. It lists him as six eight, which I probably don't discount. Oh, but it, yes. it said two eighty five. Yeah, two eighty five. Yeah. It wasn't. Listen, he had ball. He had ball with two hundred eighty five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that guy was huge. He played. He played offensive guard beside me, and we were chilling the field. I will say this, and I said this, and I've said it a hundred times: the best offensive athlete I've ever seen, Miles Gurrell. That guy was a freak. He come in the weight room. He never wanted to work out, but he go grab four hundred pounds, push it a couple times, go well, it worked out. That's it. <laughs> Who wants to go for wings? That was Miles. Who wants some beers? I was like, I, I love the guy. I mean, this this guy is. He was a stud. Uh, you know, and, and how many guys at six eight? And he was, you know, well, you three, say three thirty. Let's yeah. just live with that number. Looks good. He'd be on his hands walking stairs on his hands. Oh my god! And I'm like, what are you doing, man? I mean, he, he just he just was one of these guys. That, but you know, he used, he used to drive me crazy because we'd be in the middle of a game. We were playing guys like Lloyd Lewis, who's a mental case in Ottawa, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and this guy never takes a damn playoff. And there and there's uh, and there's Miles. So how you doing, Lloyd? How's the family? Yeah, where are you guys going after? You guys want to go for something to eat after? I'm like, hey, we're in a freaking game, buddy. Stop with the socializing. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's past, you know, no, you see a picture of my daughter here? She's looking pretty good. Hey, what do you think? No, we're in the game, Miles. <laughs> Put everything away. You know, so the, he, he, he would drive me freaking nuts, but God dang, was he a good athlete. Dave and, and I, strong. Dave, Dave and I talk about that all the time, and that is, you know, and I guess it depends on the air that you grew up in. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I I just turned fifty four, and and even if uh, you know I'm meeting Dave on the field or, or some buddies of mine, uh, we'll, I'll be friends with you in the parking lot. But 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 yeah. sometimes this the uh, this loving that happens during the game and, and and usually before the game and stuff, I just you know for a lot of us we weren't wired that way. We you know I'll talk to your wife and talk about your kids in the parking lot, but I just can't yeah. do it before the game because you're my you're my enemy during that time. Oh, yeah, because you know what? It's like if you play, and I'll just use my position, you could have a great game and you run, say, 60 plays. You give up a sack, you're a piece of garbage. I remember we, we, beat, we beat Ottawa something like, oh, God, it had to be 50-something or something. And I'm playing against Greg Marshall, one of the greatest defensive linemen ever, and I'm just kicking his bejeez. <laughs> and then at the end of the game, they put Huffer in. We got the game by like 45 points, and Huffer's doing drop back. <laughs> oh, my God, all of a sudden, I look around. Marshall put some kind of sick move on me. Whack. Hit the sack. Whack. Got the hit on upper. Then I look at the week and I go, and runner up for the player of the week. <laughs> yep, that's right. Oh, you're kidding me. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Oh, so, no, he, goes, he, goes, he goes, Walls, how about that? I go, hey, yeah, just chose me. All you have to do is two plays on freaking defense and you're a star, you jackass. <laughs> Loving this conversation with Chris Walby, three-time Grey Cup champion, nine-time All-Star. Some of the other coaches, uh, like my, one of my favorite coaches to, to talk with just, uh, you know, on a – on a day-by-day on a day 
basis was uh, Dave Ritchie, but I guess one of the coaches yeah. that you coached uh, or that coached you and uh, and had tremendous success after he left the CFL was Mike Riley. What was it like going oh. from Cal Murphy to Mike Riley, considering Riley was like the boy genius and he still continues to be a phenomenal head coach today? Yeah, you know what? It's to, you know, Cal Murphy's the kind of guy that you show up at a party and he doesn't know why you're there. Yeah. Where Mike Riley's like, hey, welcome. How are you doing? Like, Mike Riley was a defensive guru, not so much offense, but uh, smart, smart, and treated everybody. Really a player's coach. And uh, actually, we went down uh, last year. About eight of the old players went down and took in a game in Nebraska and got to see Mike. He, gave, he treated us like, like seriously, like we were just celebrities there. All around the, the campus. He oh, took us out awesome. for dinner. You know, he, and you're right. And what a facility. Listen, you know what? Uh, I went to a small, you know, NAI school in the States. And he, uh, when you go to a big school, like, and they're like, oh, it's not, it's not sold out today. We only got 90,000. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, I think the only thing that threw me off about going to Nebraska is they have these, uh, we stayed in the actual, their hotel. And you get up in the morning and for 20 bucks, you get five drinks of your choice. Plus you can eat all those burritos. What do you want? And, uh, then you, you you start getting a little fire in your belly, and then you go to the stadium and it's dry. I've never, and I guess that's how it is. Really? If you camp, yeah. if your stadium's on campus, it's all dry, right? Wow. So, yeah. so I was going through uh, step five of double uh, A, or you know, working. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you know, I'm so glad that Dave brought up Mike Riley because he's a really interesting uh, human being. You know, and, and and look, he comes by the pedigree naturally. I mean, you know, I and yeah. I, you take a look at his time in Alabama. I had a chance to talk to him when he was at Oregon State. Now, obviously, in Nebraska, and you know, briefly there in the NFL. And people always say that you can't win with a player's coach. And and I, I think, well, it depends on how you define a player's coach. Yeah. Now, I think sometimes, look, I get I get the, 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 the tough but fair because as an athlete, I don't mind tough but fair. I just want fairness. I just don't want a, a Frank Cush guy coming in, to, yeah. you know, finding yeah. me. Uh, finding. I mean, you look at that team back that Frank Cush had. That was the Tommy Clements team, and that team yeah. was unbelievable. They lose to that Skip Walker Ottawa team in the, in, the, in the Eastern Final. But I don't think you treat people that way and get the best results. I don't think you can roll over but I think Mike Riley fits right in the middle and if I was a professional athlete I look at a Mike Riley because he's so cerebral I want to play for a guy like that that's my coach no and you and you'd love him because he is that kind of guy he'd come over and ask you how you doing what's going on how you feeling are you beat up a little bit do you need some time off do you need to go on the ice tub a little bit more uh you know he just he did he, he was absolutely as you say an honest talker um, you know, like Cal Murphy would go, hey, hey uh, like you go to my buddy Mikowas. Hey, Stan Mikowas, how you like the new lockers? Stan would go, hey, they're great, coach. And then, and, 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 and then Cal would go, well, don't get used to them. And then there was, <laughs> Stan would go, what, what, what you saying? What do you mean? Am I gone? Then he, so Stan would get dressed again and go back in the workout room. It was just crazy. The psycho, the psycho you know, the way they played, uh, the, the, the sarcasm. It was always, you know, he was always like, uh, you can't make the club in the tub. Or he'd walk in there and he'd see you guys in the ice tub. He'd go, oh, boy. Well, I better get on the phone and pick up some new guys. You know, oh. just crazy crap he did. But he got he got results. Yeah, he certainly did. He's uh, he, he just one of those guys. But I agree with you. As far as a guy that uh, that I have so much respect for, and, and he's still the ultimate, uh, him and his wife, D, they're just, just nice people. They're almost you know, too nice for the coaching profession, but they're just <laughs> nice people. Uh, one final question uh, from me, Chris, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. This this might be very Winnipeg centric, but I but I have to ask you this one question because yeah. to to this day it boggles my mind. Um, Daryl Rogers, the one year coach uh, from the NFL <laughs> that came up here that thought he knew it all, uh, was he was he did he did he come across to you as a guy of this league that man this guy has no idea what he's doing because the fan in me at that time. I was I, I can't recall a, a time of uh, period considering the success the Bombers had leading into that year um, of going man why did they bring this guy in? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about Daryl Rogers. He's an interesting cat. First off, he loved O Lyman. He absolutely adores O Lyman. We go to our first practice and we're in their room and everybody what, what's that? What's going on here? There are Safeway shopping carts in our film room. We're like, what's going on? Well, every, every card's got a name. And what happens is if you pancake a guy, run him over, not trip, not, you know, you knock him over a pile, you pancake a guy, he buys you a case of beer. Wow. Well, God damn, we didn't get excited. You know, you're coming out again. You, you, you're hungry. And then it becomes guys, oh, the guy, no, he got tripped. It's not good. No, it's not good. But, uh, 
I'll tell you, we were watching film the first first week we were there in training camp, and he's watching film with his defense coordinator. He brought in I don't know who that guy was, and anyway, he goes like, hey, oh, oh, roll that film back, roll the film back, son of a gun. They're moving before the snap of the ball. No, no. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> James West goes, are you kidding me? This guy doesn't understand that you can waggle up here. Oh, oh Lord, we're in trouble. No. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there you go, man. Yeah, how true is that? Because cause you almost sensed it as a, as a guy that obviously wasn't near at the level of, of your intelligence uh, of, of the game. And I'd sit there and go, oh, good God, why? Why? <laughs> Well, you know what? Before I let you go, Chris, and we talked a little bit about uh, you know what the Bombers are doing, and, and we mentioned uh, Osh, as uh, they like to call him, but Michael O'Shea, who's always been one of my favorites, even coming out of CIS football, he was one of my favorites. I just there's everything to like about this guy, and I said to him, you know, back even when you played in college, I said, you know, with your teeth out, he goes, you had that Lambert kind of, you, you, you look like a line a linebacker, and he goes, you mean I'm ugly? You're saying I'm ugly. <laughs> Yeah. I said, well, you take a look at how you want to look at it, but I, I'm just saying you look like he has done a magnificent job where there are a lot of franchises, quite honestly, where you got to do something for me now or yesterday. You know, the Blue Bombers have hung in with him, and I think the results are showing. I'm really happy for the guy because I think he's a great human being, too. Yeah, listen, uh, the combination that him and Kyle Walters have done just a phenomenal job of bringing talent in here. I, we, I think we have a a receiving crew to the second to none. I think our offensive line might be the premier O-line in the league right now. Uh, but O'Shea is a player's coach, and, and he does a great job of shielding his players. He's, uh, you know, he, he, some people don't like the fact he kind of gets vanilla answers a lot of the times, but you know what? He, he's just a guy that the players, I mean, seriously, I'm not kidding. They love this guy. They'll go through a wall for this guy. He lets him have fun. Um, and and I, I think he understands it. Like, you know, this game has changed so much. Uh, from when we played because, you know, obviously there's more concern about CTEs and concussions and stuff like that. Now you have one full day of practice a week, which I thought was crazy. But you know what? It seems to be working, and uh, players are supposedly healthier, but it seems like there's a lot still going down. But I just I just like uh, Michael Shea, way he handles his team. I like the way he coaches. Uh, he's just a very, very intelligent uh, man as far as we all know what he can do in special teams. I remember playing against the guy, and the guy would come up, and we'd be lining up on uh, in what we call a tough position over the old line, and he'd be calling our god dang offensive plays before we're even running them. Man. So yeah. we're like, God dang it, man. Yeah. Like, but just tough, tough as nails, great guy. And I, I tell you what, Winnipeg, uh, I'm, I'm happy to have him here. I mean, they're 7 and 2 now. It took them a while to get where they were. You know, it's the third year, but uh, he's the real deal. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today, man. I mean, we've had a lot of people. We've only been on the air for four months, and this is a, kind of a new project when you do stuff like this and whenever there's a dot-com behind it, even though for the years that I've spent in major broadcast, if you want to put it that way, you know, this is a real experiment, and, and it's gone very, very well for us. But i got to tell you, this last half hour, and I, I think I'll probably speak for Dave too, it's been one of my favorites. This has just been fantastic. Listen, guys, I really appreciate you guys calling. I love talking to you guys. and So say any, anytime, man, I you got the number – Give me a dingle, man. We'll have fun. That's ah, fantastic. Hey, Thanks you, a lot, Chris. you take care. We'll talk to you again soon, Chris. All right, guys. Have a great day. That is the one and only Hall of Fame and legendary Chris Walby with as many stories oh. about uh, football in general that you're ever going to want to hear. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep.